Good afternoon again. My name is Nijana Kristeva. I am a curator at the museum and a co-curator of the coming world exhibition. Who has seen it? Raise your hands. Yes, everybody's been there. Well, thank you for coming. What was that raising hand? Uh, that was like I asked them how many people saw the exhibition. Okay, good. <laughs> I always ask this good, question. Good. <laughs> uh, yeah. no, cort, and uh, I will be very brief. Uh, we are very happy to see Max and Mariana here from Barcelona. Uh, I asked them to talk about how curatorship influences real processes in life and vice versa. They have been curators of many interesting projects and they will tell us about this. Yes, no further ado. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone for um, for coming today. Um, and I would like to thank uh, Snijana and Ekaterina for their exhibition. Um, of course, we've seen it very quickly, but I want to thank you for the tour. And I also want to thank Anna for her wonderful coordinator of, the, of us being here. And Igor in advance, who's going to be translating from the little box in there. And the technicians at the back. I can't see anything, but thank everyone for doing your, your job. Um, the title of our lecture is Curating in the Web of Life. And Max will start. Formed in the 19th century, the worldview of Western industrial modernity largely represented itself as autonomous. The affairs of man were separate from a supposedly limitless, undaunted and inexhaustible nature. The natural sciences were the authority on the earth, life, evolution, geology. Historians and social scientists studied human affairs. This ontological divide constructed a nature that was supposedly impervious to human actions, as well as divorcing social and human phenomenon from natural determinations. Yet the catastrophic effects of industrializing and capitalizing the earth have smashed this disjunction between human history and the history of life. In the last few hundred years, the earth's atmosphere have been, has been damaged by the billions of tons of CO2 from burning fossil fuels uh, such as coal. Living systems have been impoverished and artificialized. We are not only in the midst of an environmental crisis, but a crisis or revolution in how we can think plausibly about the past and narrate how we have inhabited the world. Science shows us with increasing clarity that disastrous imbalance has transpired during what is the tiny fragment of time comprising human action when it is set against the vast geological and geophysical timescale of the planet and the evolution of the web of life. Yet new fields of investigation are opening up at the intersection of the natural sciences and the humanities. New disciplines are broaching the separation between human activities and earth systems. Environmental law political ecology, ecological econo e economics, and so on. Likewise, what is at issue when artists, curators, exhibitions, and museums venture into new formations and shared, rather than adjacent, perspectives? What is at stake in a curatorial ecology, an environmental art history, or in integrating social natural processes into an institution's account of itself, and so on. So in this talk, we want to make the case that certain art practices already represent compelling examples of an intersectional environmental humanities. Yet we will show how the emergence of what we now know as contemporary art, allied with prevailing ways of conceptualizing humans' relationship with an external nature, and that these paradigms are no longer fit for purpose. Looking back to the 19th century, we will trace the origins of the disjunction between the humanities and the natural world. Fast forwarding to 1930s New York, we will see how this division was situated at the root of the prototypical institution of modern art through two uncomfortable attempts to model 
art history as an organic structure. Leading on from this, we will discuss two narrative practices that try to move towards a shared human and natural history, but that operate at vastly different temporal and geophysical scales. We will look down other paths that suggest a, hist a history not even written by humans, but by energy, and glimpse at the provocative possibilities of former art, as well as the roads not taken by history. We will end with a call to reimagine the exhibition as a historical and narrative form that is perhaps better equipped to get a political grip and to survive in the coming world. Throughout this talk, we are going to thread through the sorry. We're going to thread through this broader narrative with discussions and audio descriptions of artworks from the group exhibition 4.543 billion. The Matter of Matter, which we curated in 2017-18 at the CAPC Musée d'Art Contemporain de Bordeaux in France. We're also going to include images from other Latitudes projects, which, without necessarily referring to them directly, such as Geological Time, Geologic Time, sorry, a month-long residency program which we held at the BAM Centre for Arts and Creativity in the Canadian Rockies in Canada, which took place during the autumn of 2017. That was geologic time, sorry. I, I missed one slide, sorry. With contributions from more than 30 artists, the exhibition 4.543 billion addressed works of art, collections and cultural histories in relation to ecological processes and the geologic, and the geological scale of time. The number on the title is the age of the earth in years, but it's also an allusion to the curator Lucy Lippard celebrated number shows which she curated between 1969 and 1974. The exhibition emerged from the CAPC's building former life as an entrepôt l'année, the warehouse for colonial commodities, whose limestone walls were once deep in the ground and whose wooden beams were once part of a forest. Several of the more documentary projects on, dis on display trace the relationship between modern art, the museum, and the wealth created through extractive industry, combining approaches framed by earth sciences with colonial history. Sociology and political reportage. You have to excuse me a little bit, because I've got too much hair. And it slips a little bit, sorry. In the exhibition, Nature encompassed human organization, non-human flows, relations and substances whose configurations have shifted throughout different er eras and epochs. Modern art and modernist art history largely assented on the ontological and epistemological lie which imagine humanity and the humanities making their own history by themselves while hiding the fact that their productions, relations and economy were always teeming with biophysical processes. The increasing violence and by which the limits of the planet, its feedback loops and tipping points, are forcing themselves into world events and onto the political stage, also has profound consequences for how we narrate and re-narrate our history and what we understand as modern or contemporary when we curate exhibitions in the context of a planetary history of 4.543 billion years and as a species in the web of life. The phrase web of life, here in the title of this talk, a kind of enhanced version of systematic uh, ecological thinking, we are borrowing from Jason Moore, who introduces the idea like this in the book Capitalism and the Web of Life in 2015. The web of life is nature as a whole, nature with an emphatically lower N. This is nature as, as us, as inside us, as around us. It is nature as a flow of flows. Put simply, humans make environments and environments make humans and human organization. An earth chronology in which humanity is understood as planetary geological agent 
compels a keener temporal awareness. Moreover, it suggests new narratives for art history in which it becomes more clearly materialist. Art production to be more, could be more clearly seen as another of the traces of our urban, industrial and consumerist legacy that will remain for millions of years in the archives of the earth. Making exhibitions and doing art history are disciplines that have typically been concerned with the enlightenment and modernist impulses of producing order and giving structure. Yet as societies confront an increasing sense of the extreme unpredictability, complexity and fragility of ecosystems, systems which are now in a state that has no previous analogy, what roles might art and art narratives play in not continuing to perpetuate the myth of the autonomy of the achievements of mankind and the illusion that we have sufficient knowledge. As planetary limits are also exposing the limits of knowledge, how can traditionally authoritative institutions move forward by recognizing their own ignorance? Taking on board the, a notion of historical nature, as well as of, of modern and contemporary art, offers us, offers us a way to begin to rethink timescales and amplify environmental reflexivity. For example, in the 1980s, the invention of the discourse of sustainable development established the illusion that the planet could be managed as a set of standardized conditions and that resilience and thresholds could be negotiated by simply adding the environment as another column alongside the economic and the social in a kind of reassuring accountancy, accountancy of compromise between exploitation and conservation. The work of Amy Balkin in our exhibition 3.543 billion addressed how technocracy and finance systems have accelerated the appropriation of nature at the level of the atmosphere, bringing it, bringing it under even greater order and control. So the work of Amy is these series of numbers. Uh, the tree is a work by another artist, Pep Vidal. So now we're going to play a short audio description read by Heidi Rabin. Amy Balkin. During the course of the exhibition, today's CO2 spot price, dated 2009, charts the daily price of carbon dioxide emissions allowances in the world's largest carbon market, the EU Emissions Trading Scheme. A numbering system is manually updated every morning to show the price in euros of an entitlement to legally emit one metric ton of CO2. Polluters, power plants or factories, receive or buy emissions allowances at auctions and trade them as needed to minimize costs. A product of the increasing dominance of the finance sector and the expansion of financial derivatives that emerged in the 1970s, the carbon market fix has abstracted the qualitative problem of climate change mitigation into a commodity market based on a molecule treated as the singular cause. There is a trend towards emissions that can be lucratively avoided, while there has been little effect on structural fossil fuel dependence. In this perspective, Global warming is a market failure that can be corrected by governing the atmosphere via an economic instrument with no real material or historical reference. As recently as the year 2000, the prevailing notion of the environment and environmental issues encompass things that happen in certain essential but separate places, such as national parks, special, especially green forest, and the icy wilderness. Likewise, degradations such as mining and resource extraction, waste depositing and pollution were conceptualized as externalities. Instead of the environment, there is now growing consciousness of the web of life, the earth system. Instead of boundless growth and limitless linear progress, we find ourselves simultaneous, simultaneously facing and experiencing a point of exhaustion and no return, and a non-linear and extremely unpredictable world. The term global warming, 
emerged from the academic fields into the wider public conversation in the mid-1990s. In the same period that, in parallel, curatorial practice and biennial exhibitions began to discuss and reflect globalization and a kind of global humanism. The proliferation of biennales and art fairs created a regular and cyclical global art calendar that has somehow naturalized by its season-like rhythms. Although the history spans little more than 20 years, it's worth stressing that not only the scale, but the discursive context of what we now know as contemporary art was then tellingly very different from today. Ideas of contemporary art as a global language, a multicultural territory to be mapped, as well as a notion of the large-scale group exhibition as an orthothesis, were being first proposed and tested. The dominance of artists from the Europe and the United States started to be actively counted. The cities alone of the first Wanju Biennial in 1995, Beyond Borders, and the main title, the main section of the 23rd Biennial of Sao Paulo in 1996, Universalis are quite telling. Whereas the mode and mood of biennial seems to be anxiety mixed with hope beyond borders, conveyed a, an optimistic quotation message of global citizenship that transcended divisions between ideologies, territories, religion, race, culture, humanity, and the arts. Closing quote. So that's quite a big biennial and a lot of topics to cover. Critical positions in this global art were often forged around artists who were apparently thinking globally while working with local concepts and materials. Framing art as a kind of positivist cosmopolitan practice, being seen to forge tradition with international legibility and universal metaphors. Art that was an international language addressing current global themes. While such exhibitions may have sought to integrate post-colonial studies and, for example, meditate uh, thematically on the economic rise of the new global part players, while also embodying it, their poetic pluralism and exchange seems at best dated today, and more pointedly, seem wholly unequipped to comprehend the inescapable ecological limits which humanity is now crashing into. In short, what we know today as contemporary art really came to age in the 1990s, and it's deeply and problematically integrated with the notion of globalization. The career span of celebrated Swiss curator Harold Demon, who died recently in 2004, offers a striking companion narrative from its tradition work, tra transition work from the Kunsthalle Bern and celebrated exhibitions such as Living Your Head, When Attitudes Become Form from 1969. Through his becoming an independent, internationally fluid agent from the 1970s to 1999, definitely establishing the current format of the Venice Biennale for staging a large scale unauthored and, and authored international exhibition alongside national pavilions. Among the ephemera, correspondence, artworks, and photographs that comprised Museum of Obsessions, an exhibition dedicated to Zeman that was first presented last year at the Kutzhal Bern, was a mass of luggage tags accumulated from more than 50 years of flights in and out of Zurich, Geneva, and Bern. Barcode strips, gate deck dockets, and business class labels were peppered with the words priority, rush, short connection. A statement to a frequent flyer Zeman's curiosity, celebrity, and privileged right to roam. Credited as an artwork by Zeman himself, titled Trouble Sculpture, late 1960s, 2004, mixed media, this back totem hung for many years at the Fabrica Rosa, his archive and library in Switzerland, before the archive was purchased, after he died, uh, by the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles. Travel sculpture is today an irrefutable, uncomfortable object, 
a term that we borrow from Mexican artist Mariana Castillo de Valle, not least because it's an easy status as a retroactivated curatorial artwork, but moreover in its evidencing of the relentless growth of air travel during Zeman's lifetime and the climate peril of normalizing hypermobility. Zeman's luggage tag hoard might begin to look as a taboo, as a heap as a, as as taboo as a heap of elephant tusks. A meta history of nature, spanning only the last few decades, shows us that nature is never simply there. Different versions of it have been produced at different times. It is historical. How could we ever have thought otherwise? What allowed nature to be dismissed as immobile, impassive and immense? So much so that its limits seemed invisible. As the historians Christophe Bonoy and Jean-Baptiste Frezoz, amongst others, have shown, the disjunction of the humanities and natural processes took place through the deepening of two fields of knowledge, geology and evolutionary theory. The publication of Charles Lyell's The Principles of Geology in 1830 to 1833 provided the Western world with the first compelling argument that the Earth was radically older than the 6,000 year age that could be deduced from a literal interpretation of the Bible's account of creation. Lyell's conclusion that the Earth was several hundred million years old and the result of ancient and imperceptible changes vastly expanded and slowed the chronology and tempo of natural processes, even though we now know his estimates were in fact extremely conservative. With nature's clock recalibrated as something immense and slow rather than capricious and catastrophic, scientists such as Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace were open to pursue the notion that the origins of species might similarly be the result of millions of years of imperceptible changes. With the time frame of life radically extended and the evolution of man demonstrated as something re very recent, the gap between the natural world and the humanities was forced ever wider throughout the 19th century. As geology and the study of evolution became separated out as autonomous fields of study, the narrative of the earth and the narrative of species became desensitized to human actions and from social phenomenon. Disciplines diverged into the study of human history on the one hand and natural science on the other. A firewall was established between the time of man and the time of nature. In parallel, the purview of climatology became increasingly abstract and larger in scale, rather than based around particular places. Furthermore, soci sociology mostly excluded the natural world as a factor in its area of study, often incentivized by imperialist and colonial narratives that deemed so-called advanced societies to be impervious to what was seen as the impulsive wildness of natural influences. Where contrary positions did penetrate this sanitary cordon between nature and human society, they were often considered dangerous ideas. The artist Nicholas Mangan's two-screen solar-powered video installation titled Ancient Lights from 2015, included in the exhibition 4.543 billion, revolved around the theories of Alexander... Nicholas Mangan. Ch Sorry. <laughs> Alexander Chizevsky, a Russian scientist who, in the 1920s, proposed that sunspot activity and the 11-year solar cycle not only influenced the weather and harvests, but also correlated with the volatility and revolutionary excitability of entire populations. Having refused to retract his theories, theories that contradicted the official Soviet explanations for the Russian revolutions, he was arrested in 1942 and endured eight years of forced labor. So let's now listen to 
the audio description of this work read by Justy Phillips. Nicholas Mangan. Ancient Lights from 2015 is a two-screen looped audio-visual installation that is powered literally as well as metaphorically by the energy of the sun. A photovoltaic panel system has been installed on the roof terrace of the CRPC building. This charges the batteries located within the gallery that power the video projectors. The title of the work, Ancient Lights, derives from a legal notion of a right to light and signs that can still be seen in London to mark windows that are protected from any future construction that might obstruct their access to sunlight. On one screen, we see a Mexican 10 pesos coin in a never-ending slow motion spin. The reverse of the coin depicts the sunstone, a carving that is key to our present understanding of Aztec cosmology and the belief that constant blood offerings were required to prevent the sun from disappearing. The companion film weaves together several formal and discursive threads, both human nature and natural history. We see solar cycle charts that have their origins in the theories of Alexander Chichevsky, the Russian scientist who proposed that the 11-year cycle of the sun's magnetic turbulence could be linked to social unrest and revolutions. A rotating cross-section of a tree shows rings that hold information about the climate of the past, as if a wooden database. Ranks of mirrors focus sunlight onto a central tower boiler at a solar power plant near Seville in Spain. Thanks to salt storage technology, this facility is the first solar power station capable of operating 24 hours a day. As well as addressing broader narratives about periodicity and transformation, with the off-grid powered ancient lights, Mangan also hints at small-scale efforts to circumvent the political intransigence in his native Australia in relation to fossil fuels and climate change. The short temporality of humans and what we might call the specially epistemological zone of the humanities cascaded through industrial modernity. Modern art and, sorry, modern art and the shape of our history. In 1930s America, just as the cultural moment of the dominant arc of Western art was taking abstraction on a geological diversion from Paris to New York in the build-up for the Second World War, two somewhat divergent structural and morphological visions of art history were literally sketched out. Taking the form of a tree or a root in different states of abstraction, they offer a telling picture of nature being put to work as a metaphor for hum human artistic progress. The tree of modern art planted 60 years ago by Miguel Covarrubias first appeared in Vanity Fair magazine in 1933, a few years before Alfred Barr made his now famous diagram of the stylistic evolution of art 1890 to 1935. Barr founded what we would become, would, be, would become the archetypical institution of the 20th century, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, that opened in 1929, and he was its founding director. This diagram appeared on the cover of the catalogue accompanying the 1936 Museum of Modern Art exhibition Cubism and Abstract Art. Not this one, the one of Alfred Barr. Anyway, back to Covarrubias, which is this one. Covarrubias tree has definitely 50, has exactly 50 leaves, each representing a modernist artist, all white European men. The tree seven roots are representing as the founding fathers, Delacroix, Daumier, David, Poussin, Angre, Courbet, and Corot. Discarded at the side of the tree, ancient and indigenous art, represented by a Greek bust and the caricature of a Dogon tribal figure, set by the dead leaf, as if to emphasize the vigor and autonomy of the moderns. A man lies at the base of the tree, contemplating a picture frame, a satirical depiction of Barr deciding what to put in his museum. Although it was undoubtedly intended as a light-hearted and didactic tool, the tree genealogy presents what are obviously extreme functional simplifications. 
the tree symbolize the, the tree symbol naturalizes the historical and material dynamics of culture and presents it as inevitable as growth. We contemplate natural form, yet only see human achievement in it. Relations are reduced, not even to a play of pressures and responses, but to a one-directional flow of influence nutrients. The realities and flows of technological, economic, and colonial domination, of industrialization and capitalism, are at once hidden and yet implied as if forces of nature. Yet this seeming naturalism is tempered when we realize that, in order to accommodate mergers and reconvergences, the tree's growth and diagrammatic branching out has been directed and pruned like a espaliered fruit tree or a bonsai. The plant has been shaped and trained in order to be more productive or to conform to an ideal. Barr's analytical diagram, on the other hand, employs the names of schools and movements for its node labels instead of individual artists. So moving from the top of the page to the bottom, it reads more like a system of rivers or drainage basins with flow and gravity taking the place of, of growth. Its schematic abstraction presents history teleologically as a kind of rational, scientific, and technological channeling of nature into ever purer forms of abstraction. Although here modern art history is more honestly presented in relation with industrialization, with the inclusion of machine aesthetic as one of the labels, Barr's use of red for this label, along with Negro sculpture, Near Eastern art, and Japanese prints, show that these factors and object and image-making practices somehow existed for Barr on an altogether different register. And just a side note here to acknowledge um, Ad Reinhardt, who also made his own tree diagram in 1946. The structural and diagrammatic imagining of history and the reimagining of art history is, of course, also a matter of temporality. George Kubler's influential 1962 book, The Shape of Time, Remarks on the History of Things, proposed a novel form for an art history that paused from analyzing the symbolism of individual objects in order to address their place in a morphology of time. Kubler portrayed an unfurling of sequences and traits, needs and problems, beautiful, hopeless, or useless things that might form patterns akin, akin to germinal life or the evolution of a language. Decades before, Fernand Braudel broke with historians who simply treated environmental factors such as seasons, the weather, the state of the oceans, or crop diseases as a passive backdrop to human actions. In his trilogy of books, The Mediterranean from 1949, nature finally had an agency in a long perspective on extended periods of time, trends, and patterns. Brodel distinguished three temporalities separating the domains of nature and society. Nature and the climate were almost imperceptibly slow. Economy and social life were more rapid. The time of events, politics and people, the history of individuals with names, was the fastest of all. Like many other historians of the 20th century, Brodel assumed that the natural world was so slow and cyclical that man's relation to it was somehow timeless, and thus it could not be historicized. In an apparent affront to the long duration history founded by Brodel, microhistory forged a different methodology, an extremely close up and reduced scale form of analysis. The tradition of microhistory emerged in the, 19, in the late 1970s and 1980s, particularly following the appearance of this book by Carlo Ginzburg, 
the cheese and the worms, the cosmos of a 16th century miller that was published in 1976, a minor analysis of documentary evidence of the life of a man, otherwise unknown, who was tried and condemned to death by the Inquisition. Where a global history would have faced would have to face the task of incorporating its own Eurocentrism and relativism, writing in the perspectives of non-Western cultures that had it dismissed, microhistory suggested dispensing with scholarly presumptions about pre-modern societies and dismissing the sharp separation between official written history and other forms of evidence and meaningful things. By looking at and importantly, narrating the very specific in great detail by being open to anomalies, clues, coincidences and accidents. This kind of approach also suggested how world events are often hinged on tiny details or incidents and how they might have turned out radically different. Criticism of the tendency to focus on fragments rather than larger structures are also attracted arboreal metaphors. Proper historians studied the trunk tree or its, bra or its branches, whereas microhistory was only concerned with the leaves. Microhistory spoke of the exceptional normal, the extraordinary within every day, clues and evidence that could nevertheless have a large scale reach. As Giovanni Levy has written, even the apparently minutest action of, say, somebody going to buy a loaf of bread actually encompasses the far wider system of the whole world's grain markets. Likewise, a coffee bean might open up a story about how, for almost two centuries, European bourgeois society, slavery, plantations and a drink were inextricably linked. Burnished nuggets of the past in the form of the seeds, the seeds of Coffea Arabica, coffee beans, still occasionally materialize as if out of nowhere at the CAPSA, the venue which hosted the exhibition 4.543 billion. One day, one might appear on top of a pile of papers in an office desk. Weeks later, another bean might show up in the middle of one of the exhibition galleries. Several sacks were clearly spilled over the years in the building's life as a colonial commodities warehouse, and coffee beans, as well as peppercorns, found their way into the nooks and crevices of the wooden floorboards and beams, only to emerge again years later. In the early stage of research, Francois Posay from the exhibition team showed us the stash he had been keeping in his desk for more than 20 years and it was one of the first items to go on the exhibition checklist. It was not until the emergence of environmental history in the United States in the 1960s that history began to be imagined from the point of view of ecosystems or extra human natures. Environmental history looked at humans as biological entities. Likewise, could we at the very least imagine an environmental art history that looks at artworks and artists as biological and geological agents before they are impressionist or post-minimalist or anything else? In this sense, our history is not just an expression of human inventiveness, but something until now only made possible by a certain stability in the atmosphere. In discussing how storytelling might integrate with environmental science, the anthropologist Julie Krishank, Krishank recently posed the rhetorical questions, are glaciers good to think with? She suggests that glaciers and glacial stories be allowed to disrupt the, and exceed conceptual fields and dominant frameworks of knowledge. In 1949, the same year that Rodel published The Mediterranean, ecologist Aldo Leopold coined the term to think like a mountain. 
in his book, A Sand County Almanac. He proposed that history could be narrated, or indeed art could be made, from the point of view of non-human actors. Could we imagine art without humans? The starting point for the exhibition, 4.543 billion, was thinking from the ecological and the geological, and a perspective where artworks could be conceived as dynamic, organic and inorganic matter through time, raw materials with a particular mineral, energetic and a chemical legacy. This perspective was offered in contrast to the prevailing notion of artworks as unchanging authored objects that seemingly only make sense within the human construction of our history. Throughout the process, we wanted to undo the notion of the autonomous artwork, to undermine art as something that's on or off, ontolog as an ontological condition, and instead present artworks and meaningful things as part of a material continuum of various qualities, whether of raw materials, archives, documentation, evidence of or commentary on. White Rock Line is an artwork by the British sculptor, sculptor Richard Long that was commissioned on the occasion of the renovations of the CRPSA in 1990. Sited permanently on the museum's roof terrace, the work comprises a 40 metre long, 1.5 metre wide rectangle of pale, macritic and bioclastic Tyronean limestone fragments. The stone was sourced from the Malville Quarry near the town of La Tour Blanche in the Dordogne region, a site owned by Lafarge, a company that specialises in cement construction aggregates and concrete. By 2014, White Rock Line had turned a dull, cinerous colour due to general airborne dirt combined with algal growth and pollen. With the artist's consent, it was decided to replace the stones with fresh white ones. The grade stones were retrieved by Lafarge and later used for road foundations. Yet the Se Apice head of collection and Cadenet kept one of the old fragments on a bookshelf in her office as a memento. No longer art, this decommissioned stone was exhibited as something that had gone back to being merely geological matter between 89.8 and 93.9 million years old. In a similar way, the Siapese building itself was not just an architectural backdrop, but a site of reciprocal interaction, evoking a shared history of nature and human society that encompassed the ancient microscopic sea life within the limestone of its walls, the trees that became its beams, the historical labor of the slaves in the French-owned Caribbean islands, the fertility of the soil in the plantations, and so on. So this led us to approaches that sought to combine material readings and hard science with political and cultural interpretations to integrate socio-environmental matter and flows into historical accounts. Or moreover, we became interested not just in art histories and practices that have a relationship with natural histories, but in what, ha what emerges when the whole notion of two separate elements and interaction comes undone. Projects that collapse the centuries-old humanist separation between natural history and human history, and that often, like microhistory, take place through narrative approaches. In the case of Maria Teresa Alves, this has taken on a new form of research, a kind of botanical biography. Now let's listen to an audio description of Maria Teresa's work in the exhibition. Maria Teresa Alves. Ongoing since 1999, Maria Teresa Alves's Seeds of Change project focuses on the phenomenon of ballast flora, 
an overlooked area of botanical study enmeshed with the early history of global capitalism and the slave trade. Since around 1920, modern cargo ships have taken on water as ballast to stabilize an unloaded vessel. Yet in the past, sailing ships would have used soil as ballast if their load of colonial goods was too light. This was bulk that could be easily discarded to free up the ship. From around 1500 to 1815, countless tons of this filler material and its attendant seeds were displaced throughout the network of global maritime commodity and slave trading to be dumped on riverbanks and shores around the port cities of Europe. Still today, many alien plants, inadvertent colonists, including those originating in Africa and the Americas, can thus be found rooted in these sites. They often spring up when ground is disturbed for new construction. Although the slave trade was made illegal in France in 1815, no effective enforcement on ship owners was set up until 1831. Clandestine expeditions persisted in Bordeaux until at least 1837. At least 42 slaving voyages are known to have left the port after 1815. Alvis has undertaken research and fieldwork in several locations, including Marseille and Dunkirk, as well as in the British port that leaves all other cities far behind in terms of the sheer number of slaving expeditions that left its docks, Liverpool. The artist traced the whereabouts of ballast spoil sites through maps and port records, gathering textual and photographic evidence, often with the collaboration of local residents. Alves has also taken soil samples and endeavoured to germinate the archaic seeds to create a flourishing of the ostensibly historical archives that have lain dormant for sometimes hundreds of years. Recently, this has led to the creation of a ballast flora garden on a floating barge in the city of Bristol. History of art could also be told through the prism of energy, revealing just how deeply the art theories of the past were conditioned by particular ecological metabolisms. Four works in the exhibition by artist Alessandro Balteo Yazbek and in collaboration with the art historian Media Farzin, were parts of two series dealings with the interpretation of art history in the global politics of petroleum and conflict, and vice versa. Each one incorporated its own wall labels as an integral part of the work, juxtaposing factual evidence with quotations to suggest what are sometimes deliberately tenuous connections between the sculptures of Alexander Calder, Venezuelan and American oil interests, the Cold War, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and its trustee from 1932 to 1974, the businessman and politician Nelson Rockefeller. The work of Terence Gower fused the story of art and architecture with mineral wealth. We're going to now listen to another audio. Wilderness Utopia and Public Spirit, both from 2008, tell the story of the interplay between uranium and urbanism, money and modern art in 1950s Canada. Latvian-born mineral prospector Joseph H. Hirschhorn used his uranium mining fortune to amass one of the world's largest private collections of art which later formed the basis for the opening in 1974 of the museum and sculpture garden that bears his name on the National Mall, Washington, D.C. Terence Gower's display case installation and fictional promotional video were first exhibited as elements of a commission at the same Herschel Museum in 2008. Yet long before the Washington Museum was founded, Herschel dreamt of a utopian community in Ontario that would integrate a permanent home for his art collection, alongside his new uranium mine, its offices and worker housing. In 1955, Hirschen hired the architect Philip Johnson to develop plans, yet the project never came to fruition. Marianne Heyer's Saga Night documented the making of a sculpture that now forms a part of the collection of Mai Haugen an open-air museum of cultural heritage in Lillehammer, Norway. Maihaugen features a collection of historical buildings, including churches, farmsteads and shops, laid out in a more or less chronological manner. 
The residential area of the museum includes houses representative of the decades of the 1900s to the House of the Future from 2001. Showing the development of the Norwegian home and different architectural styles. Marianne installed, installed a new section of asphalt on this street from a point in time that corresponds to 1968. The year of the first petroleum and natural gas discoveries on Norwegian territory in the North Sea. The asphalt runs through the sections corresponding to the 70s, 80s and 90s and finishes where the street ends at the edge of a forest. Saga Night calls attention to the radical changes that oil brought to modern Norway, a narrative that is conspicuously absent in the typical history of the nation. It points to an economy and culture not built not through generations of human toil or thriftiness, but through a sudden and decisive appropriation of vast natural wealth. From a petro-capital perspective, Norway's neighbours are not Sweden and Denmark, but Qatar, Iran or the United Arab Emirates, states that have similarly invested substantial oil money in cultural projects and contemporary art. For the period of 2005-2006, Marianne was awarded a Norwegian government artist grant, money that originates from North Sea petroleum revenue. Yet she chose to continue working jobs in publicly funded Norwegian art institutions. She, put, she placed her income in shares in the Norwegian oil and offshore industry, thus reinvesting the grant money back into its original source. She later, uh, the later sales of the shares financed the production of, of the project. Part of the appeal of microhistory an object and material biography is not only the possibility it offers to reconcile social, cultural, artistic and environmental history, but, as we mentioned previously, its task of opening up historical possibilities to the perhaps and the may have been. The current climate crisis was not inevitable and it's not something in which we have now just become to be aware. Likewise, specific and purposeful actions by certain powerful individuals, states or corporations have had a disproportionately damaging effect and ignored centuries of warnings and evidence. Christina Hamauer and Roman Keller's project, A Road Not Taken from 2006-2007, form part of their exhibition United Alternative Energies, a survey of their work, which we curated at Kunsthal Aarhus in Denmark in 2011. It focused on energy history and a fragment of a technological relic. On, on June 1979, United States President Jimmy Carter inaugurated an installation of 32 solar heaters on the roof of the west wing of the White House. On the same day, he announced federal initiatives intended to secure that 20% of American energy would come from renewable sources by the, by the year 2000. In his speech on that day, Carter declared, a generation from now, the solar heater can either be a curiosity, a small piece, an example of a road not taken, or it can just simply be a small part of one of the greatest and most exciting adventures ever undertaken by the American people. Harnessing the power of the sun to enrich our lives as we move away from our crippling dependence on foreign oil. The showcase energy program was largely, largely overshadowed by the Iranian hostage crisis just a few months after Carter's speech and his successful free market champion Ronald Reagan, who reportedly thought the panels were a joke, had the White House installation shortly after dismantled. A Road Not Taken is a documentary film essay which follows the artists as they located the panels on the roof of a college cafeteria in Maine, 
where they had been functioning between 1992 until 2005. And their subsequent road trip with two of the panels strapped on the roof of a vegetable oil-powered pickup truck. Carter's warning was partially correct in that the two panels are now museum pieces. The artist presented one to the Jimmy Carter Library and Museum in Atlanta and the other one to the National Museum of American History in Washington. Yet, how can Carter's long-sightedness and the failure of his ambitions be understood over 40 years after? The film traces the contemporary resonances, the political and historical echoes of this largely forgotten episode in American policy through interviews with those involved, including the President Carter himself. Projects such as those by, that we've presented by Amy Balkin, Nicholas Mangan, Maria Teresa Alves, Terence Gower, Mariana Heyer, and Hemawa Keller, and others demonstrate how we tell stories about the past is intimately connected with how we respond to the challenges of the present and the future. Little more than a month ago, the Museum of Modern Art, New York, that is quintessential institution of 20th century art that we've men mentioned several times, unveiled a reset of its collection displays. The new presentations have finally discarded the movement by movement doctrine that for decades was ingrained in the museum to classify the art of the last century. Many more women, non-white and non-Western artists are on view. Though still broadly chronological, the displays now tolerate detours, misfits and fortuitous juxtapositions. Photography, displayed in its own separate zone for decades, now mingles with paintings, film, and performance. The orthodoxy of masterpiece, genius, and breakthrough has been abandoned, as well as words like expressionism or fauvism excised from gallery labels. So the obsession with a unidirectional narrative is beginning to be eroded, yet something far more radical is required. The human-induced climate crisis has profound implications for how we think about history and the birth of the modern world, starkly bringing to mind the possibility of human extinction. Could we, somewhat paradoxically, reimagine historical practices without humanity and revisualize the connections of the past, present and future beyond human experience? Could we imagine not just an art history beyond modernity or genres, but one beyond recorded history in a conventional sense, a cultural history of species? The question of how we are to conceive of art history and art production within socio-ecological systems is an open one. Thinking and building a new logic outside of the dualism of humanity on the one hand and nature on the other necessitates new narratives, new grammar, and new relational strategies. It also calls for new language, the web of life, climate emergency rather than climate change, global heating rather than global warming, for example. History in this alternative perspective is a history where human activity has always been joined with the web of life. Following a sense of both humanity in nature and nature in humanity, we could or could we imagine an art history and a way of making exhibitions that is both outside in and inside out. Instead of three metaphors and in simplifying flow diagrams, we might imagine an intricate network as complex as the flows of the Earth system or global movements of matter and capital. In terms of exhibiting how natures have been historically situated and represented and how social and cultural relations 
are structured, framed, or transverse, or tra sorry, or transversed by flows of matter and energy. This would suggest not just a new kind of our history, but new kinds of institutions of art with a small A, which definitely abandon the divide between the humanities and the natural world. Curiously, in 1936, the same year of the exhibition Cubism and Abstract Art that we mentioned that was curated by Alfred Barr and his diagram uh, this, of the stylistic evolution of art in the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the museum also produced this show by Edward Steichen titled Delphiniums. It was a week-long exhibition of flowers, modern flowers, hybrid and cultivars presented as creative productions of the photographer Edward Steichen himself. Industrial capitalism gave us the collection of modern of the modern museum of Mo the Museum of Modern Art in New York. But also institutions such as Kew Gardens in London, the largest and most diverse botanical and mycological collection in the world. The present and the future requires reconstructing and refreshing the theo theoretical model of the whole genre of the exhibition, its possibilities and conditions. Allowing a wider and deeper sense of the exhibition, its possibilities, sorry, did I repeat that? Allowing a wider and deeper sense of image and object making lineages would tackle the damaging split still betwe left between the humanities and the natural world and the imprint that this rift has left on the institutions of knowledge, which allowed our history and artistic practices to be considered an alternative order to the forces and objects of the web of life. If the history of the earth is compressed in 24 hours, the modern man would only appear in the last minute. And the industrial revolution and fossil fuel based capitalism would transpire only in the last two thousandths of a second. While the climate that facilitated the birth of cultures and civilizations across the world was marked by stability, the coming world promises unprecedented disturbance and overcrowding, extinction and conflict. The looming questions will not only hinge on political decisions around what is no longer tolerable, the how much more, the how many more, at what point, but around our capacity to connect and reconcile apparently contradictory scales and temporalities, the very small with the extremely large, the very specific with the broad ranging, individual, personal and professional decisions, such as our taking a flight to Moscow to present you with this talk, or what you'll choose to eat tonight for dinner. With something structural factors such as subsidies and penalties governing the future of transport or international consumer trends and treaties regulating agriculture. As cultural theorist Mackenzie Walk has suggested, civilization is currently suffering from bad metaphysics. The inability to connect the particular and the general. While politics is too local and short-termist, Design is too one-size-fits-all, for example. The institutional structures that mediate between the totality and particular situations are now seen to be falling apart of their own accord, Walk has written. However elusive the roles of art and exhibition making may be, they offer a glimpse of concepts and registers that seem to be in tension being brought together of tacking back and forth between deep time and microhistory, species history and the history of capitalism or industrialization, between a person's private world of experience and imagining collective pasts or futures. What we find is not a universal or singular structure, not a unitary tree of modernity, but countless very specific perspectives and practices social and ideological systems, institutions and imaginations, in varying states of health. We'll end with, with this image. 
In 1990, the AIDS activist and artist David Wonorovich made a work which consists of a photograph showing his hand holding a tiny frog with the following text overlaid in the corner. What is this little guy's job in the world? If this little guy dies, does the world know? Does the world feel this? Does something get displaced? If this little guy dies, does the world get a little lighter? Does the planet rotate a little faster? If this little guy dies without his body to shift the current of air, does the air flow perceptibly faster? What shifts if this little guy dies? Do people speak language a little bit differently? If this little guy dies, does some kind, does some kid somewhere wake up with a bad dream? Does an almost imperceptible link in the chain snap? Will civilization stumble? Thank you. Now, if you have questions, please raise your hand and we'll give you the microphone. You may ask both in Russian and in English. A lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was wondering, you were talking about um, the need of new institutions, new language, new way to approach exhibitions, exhibition making, and you're curators, um, and I'm a curator, so I'm, <laughs> I'm wondering what, um, in your future projects, let's say, how would you, or you did already incorporate some of that new language or new ways of approaching? exhibition making and um, my second question uh, is that um, in the exhibition you saw I didn't bring you to one part we have um, we commissioned three uh, different an artist a theorist and a philosopher to make predictions of the future from 2030 to th which is the timeline we have in the in the exhibition mm -hmm. title so um, I wonder what are your predictions of, of, of that? I knew this question would come up. It doesn't have to be that timeline, yeah. obviously not so. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, th with, this is one thing that we've, um, you know, everyone wants to know what can we do and how we can face what's coming up. But we don't have the crystal ball. I'm sorry I didn't bring it. <laughs> um, and we're just curators trying to figure out exactly these very big questions. And being, having worked with, um, on, I hate this terminology of ecological issues, but this is what it is. We're actually being attacked many times like the green curators, um, which we're not. But um, just it seems like if you're kind of working on these issues, you're kind of very quickly um, labeled. Um, but we don't. We don't have the answer, but we have been thinking a lot since the beginning in 2000. The first big project was in 2006, um, looking into land art, the 1960s sort of production of art and kind of how it's been um, understood in contemporary art or how it's been the legacy of it and been in contemporary art. And then you start realizing, you know, like we were saying in the historical section, these questions come from very, very much farther back than we realized. We just think that we have to start thinking about these things now. But artists were thinking about this, not just artists, writers, historians, politicians, economists, were thinking about these issues way before we even think. And it's just when you start digging into it that you realize, well, you're really being a bit late. We're being very late um, in, you know, defining what is it that we need to, or we feel that we need to do, defining new terms, new, you know, the Guardian changing, how they talk about climate and things like this, how we curate exhibitions, how we behave, the personal bit, you know, this, this personal and big that we were just kind of mentioning, which is the everyday struggle that we all have. Like, you know, I was kind of saying, us coming here to Moscow, what we're going to have for dinner, how we go home, all of these decisions in the everyday. 
um, are, are, are important. So I'm trying to look at my little bit of frog every day and kind of ask myself those questions. What is it that I can do as a, as a human, but also as a professional working in the arts? I don't have the answer. Um, it's, it's kind of in progress. I think the answer is, is very much that. It's, it's in progress, but not just me, obviously everyone participating in the community. Um, as for future projects, I think this is, again, put into practice on an everyday basis and questioning it. And also, being independent curators, you bring your own voice to institutions when you're being involved in curating the next exhibition or the next whatever it is that they invite you to do and actually putting those questions on the table. I think this is probably one of the um, most valuable um, contributions that we can make. Asking questions to the institutions that sometimes they're too trapped on their everyday doing and not thinking the big picture and asking how are you um, dealing with this and this and this, for instance, that would be a, and we've, we've done, um, we've done a number of, I mean, I can't go into details now, but we've done a number of, of those issues and you know, when, when institutions respond, oh, we've always done it like this. It's just, is exactly what snaps me and just like, well, this is not good enough, you know? Mm. No, I, I think also in terms of future institutions, I think um, as we were trying to outline, I would, we would like to see more kind of porousness between modern art and contemporary art institutions. And not only that, between um, institutions telling other kinds of histories that mm. are always been part of those stories that up until now have pretty much been um, we so pretended are yeah. just stories just art stories but but they're not so I mean there are uh, examples of institutions that um, have been very successful um, kind of telling other narratives cutting across um, archives or on natural histories, I'm thinking of Hakeve, um, the Haus der Kulturell der Welt in, in Berlin, um, which is a, a, yeah, an amazing example of, of, of those kind of practices. Um, but yeah, maybe as kind of art people, <laughs> we need to go to. <laughs> I know what you're going to say. Kind of <laughs> um, yeah. But also, yeah, in our experience of doing the show in, in Bordeaux, as far as our future practice or um, what we would like to do, I think would, yeah, would definitely be to produce exhibitions that are perhaps kind of uncomfortable for um, just an art museum. Um, and I think as we were kind of trying to hint at with inclusion of, um, of things that weren't artworks in an art show or things that used to be artworks, or um, we also had um, documents that had been burnt, for example. Like, so it's trying to show this the, the boundaries between what we consider, oh, this is artwork, this is an archive, this, you know, that goes in the archive, this is documentation, so it doesn't really count as a, you know, there's all these kind of weird prejudices that um, exist in art that mm. um, we were, yeah, very kind of interested in, in teasing out. And I think actually um, it's worth mentioning the Documenta 13 that uh, Caroline Christoph Barkiev, Barkiev, um, directed I think that was yeah that was a, a very influential um, and important project in the history of large scale exhibition makings including opening up other narratives non-human narratives um, and I think that yeah that was a, an exhibition that has an important legacy mm -hmm. thank you so much for the lecture it was very uh, inspiring and thank you heart heartbreaking as well i know <laughs>
something we discovered and that was previously, I don't think anyone in the museum had um, heard about it. It was the, the record of the construction of the building by the architect. So it was this folio of papers which we, we showed in a stack as if, so it was also beginning to um, kind of plant metaphorical um, ideas about strata and the, the links between geological strata and archiving. Mm -hmm. So it, it, what was called the, it's kind of the, there. the document of works. So it was um, the architect's it's record that. of employment and materials of the, of the construction of the building, which was actually made very quickly. So it shows every piece of stone, uh, every plank of wood, every hour worked by the workers. So we kind of refer to it as a um, Victorian Excel, Excel. sheet. Mm. Um, so that was kind of room one. It was um, very much front and centre. Um, and then there was also within that um, that same room, there was a lithograph of um, a plantation in the Antilles, which is where the pre predominant trade was coming in uh, to Bordeaux, and a lithograph of the quayside in, in Bordeaux. And in the middle was one page. We only found two pages of... Um, documents listing what would have been in the warehouse at any one time. So this was another kind of spreadsheet type um, document that showed a list of um, coffee and coffee, indigo rice, and rubber. So pepper. we kind of set out that very uh, graphically in the first room. Anything to add? Um. There was also a, a, one of the new commissions. There was two new commissions. Um, was an artist called Ilana Halperin. And she made a collaboration with the university geology department. Um, and her piece consisted of uh, one of the museum guards would show you a fragment of stone and then tell a, tell a story as if the... A letter. As if sure. the stone was, was, was speaking to you. Um, which related to the kind of... The almost... It's very kind of visceral... When you look at the stone close up, it's a very coarse limestone. So you can see very clearly it's made of dead animals. Yeah, it's it's not like a kind after. of smooth limestone. Um, so mm -hmm. her piece, yeah, as I mentioned, was one example of a project which connected out to different um, scientific communities um, who had different perspectives on the building. So there was also a talk from a, from mm -hmm. a geologist. Uh, it's just one example. But yeah, the building... As, a, as we mentioned with the coffee beans, these things literally come out of the ceiling. It's like, it sort of weeps its history. And the same stone is very characteristic. Like you would, you would find all the buildings in Bordeaux are made from that same stone. So it's almost something that if you're from Bordeaux, you, it's kind of unnoticeable. It's kind of everyday. Um, all the facades are the same. They've gone, obviously, because of pollution, much darker than... Um, than this particular building, but um, but yeah, you can see the sea sea life is still very much noticeable in the corners of the building. So that's something that for us was very telling. Um, also, being a very functional building that was made basically of two materials, stone and wood. So, and being a colonial warehouse, it, it just kind of brought all this narrative of of um, you know the first question was like, where is this stuff coming from and it's just it just went from there, and then as soon as we kind of started with these questions, all the we talked to everyone in the museum, different staff members, and everyone started kind of connecting and kind of opening up and sharing their their knowledge with us. So it was really incredible that to be able to pull information and knowledge from all of these museum workers that have been there working for many years. A lot of them have um, you know acquired a lot of information that we wouldn't have otherwise. Mm stuff is in people's minds, not sometimes in archives. So that's also very important, the orality of this, how you transfer this knowledge to, to other people. Yeah. So that was, yeah, that's an example of, of what we, why we meant, wanted to mention the practice of microhistory as, as well, is that a lot of the show came out of just this sort of foren almost forensic, obsessive um, research into the, into the place and the building.
Thank you for so thought-provoking lecture. Thank you. I would like to ask you uh, a bit personal question. Sure. Uh, there are two types of people uh, and artists, as, as far as I know, uh, people who divide uh, humanity and nature and people who think that that is the one uh, peaceful object. And I wanted to ask, uh, did you work with uh, artists uh, who think that nature and people and humanity should be divided? And uh, what did they say? And what is your personal opinion about this? Did we work with artists? I'm not sure that we did work with okay. <laughs> artists who thought that. Um, do you have a... Yeah. Um, maybe you mean like uh, not from the perspective of the human, like that it's not so great to be one one entity. Well, I was thinking about the environmental uh, uh, sphere and the natural sphere. So. I I, I see. I, I think I see what you mean. Um, I guess. Um, one approach that we took to it in the show was this idea of evidence. So the idea that some artworks were kind of um, more like a, a commentary or a kind of confirming our um, perspective on the show, but others were evidence of practices, if you see what I mean. So um, they were kind of symptoms of that worldview that you're describing. So it wasn't like we worked with those artists, but we presented them in a way that they were evidence of... Um, I mean, you couldn't say that the artists were necessarily sympathizing with, um, with industrializing nature, but as an example, we included um, a series of posters that were commissioned by Shell, which was mm. at the oil company Shell, um, I think I showed that. So they commissioned an artist somewhere. called Pierre Theron to make a series of posters. Um, so he came to the refinery in Shell and made these, um, these, these, these studies for posters. So I don't know what his, his um, ethical position was one way or the other, but um, this is like a visual culture which emerged from petrol culture, if you like. So you could say that was a different kind of register of of art practice within the show, if that makes sense, yeah. Any more questions? Um, <laughs> I'm also very concerned uh, in the topic of uh, ecology, and uh, I wanted to ask you, is there, are there any ways of making uh, an art exhibition an ecological way? Hmm. I mean, all these uh, art uh, transportations and printing these uh, information lists and PR lists, is there The most way ecological way we have the show in your mind. <laughs> yeah, so is there right? any ways to uh, produce an art exhibition more ecologically? There are ways to do it more ecologically, completely 100% ecologically. I don't think it will be possible. Mm. That's the short. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I don't think, um, I mean, the, uh, an, an analogy would be um, academic conferences, for mm. example. Um, scientific conferences or art conferences or there's you know whole armies of people flying around the world to present to sit in rooms and present papers to each other in in person and these are events that have you know huge values scientifically um, but you might say if you're a sci climate scientist why would I fly halfway around the world to give a talk about the ethics of climate change. So, you know, the, there's a, these other fields also have these same conflicts because they also realize that, you know, these conferences are not just literally about exchanging information in the same way that an art exhibition is not just literally about exchanging information. You know, they're about bodies in rooms and bodies moving through spaces and bodies meeting other bodies and human interaction is, yeah, is a, 
invaluable part of that. Otherwise, academic conferences, it may as well be people sitting in at home watching YouTube, you know, because there's plenty of interesting content on YouTube. Yeah, but even <laughs> watching YouTube, you're consuming energy. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> but I mean to say is that I, I don't, I don't think it's a on or an off mm. condition. You know, there's ways you could make things more more efficient and more effective. Go to less conferences. Go to less biennials. Um, by all means, but um, I think a zero carbon footprint art world, you could imagine it, but it would be something completely different as a, you know, as we said in art and contemporary art and, and globalization went hand in hand. So you'd have to almost imagine art communities shrinking, shrinking or you know, it throws into question all sorts of questions about internationalization and what kind of um, what kind of professional life an artist might aspire to have, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, how we think about our ecosystems as well. You know, we think about what we all we've been talking about historically about um, you know the story of modern art in Europe and America and. That's a story of, um, of focused in very small places as well, but it's a story that's been internationalized. And yeah, I think it's it's um, it's hard to say what what the future of art holds in that respect. But um, perhaps we're seeing, certainly in terms of biennial culture, a turn towards um, a focus on on regional communities and this idea of being global and international and having to have a list of artists that is fair to the whole <laughs> distribution of populations on mm -hmm. the earth is maybe something that is um, just unsustainable so yeah it's a question that is is kind of unanswerable I think but it does throw into question very urgent and difficult questions about yeah. art scenes and what it means to be local and international and also what it means to have the right to or the privilege to be able to travel and I hope that helps uh, well that was supposed <laughs> to be helpful but. thank you <laughs> but maybe someone else has a different I opinion I don't know I mean it's in, not an easy in, in like the food world there's a movement of kilometer zero food right but Kilometer zero art would be very hard to imagine. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. Друзья, будут ли у вас еще вопросы? Any more questions? Uh, если нет, то в таком случае no я бы хотел еще добавить, что like музей Гараж благодарит компанию Сибур за поддержку is, данной лекции. Uh, like Следите, пожалуйста, за мероприятием на сайте. Мы будем lecture. очень рады видеть вас. Спасибо, Марс. Спасибо, Марианна. 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 Спасибо, Марианна